I would like to talk a little bit about how that, that what the states have done has impacted and influenced the federal legislation. And we have some amazing panelists who have really been leading this charge in Tennessee, Kentucky, and then uh, with the Pew folks just everywhere. I'm going to let each panelist um, introduce themselves so you can get a sense of who they are and how they came to this issue of criminal justice reform. Just introduction. Yes, it is. Thank you, Julie. Thanks for inviting me today. I am uh, Michael Curcio. I'm a member of the Tennessee General Assembly on the House side. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the House. And my district is actually just outside of, of Metro Nashville, so just west of here, um, Dixon County, Hickman County, and Murray County, Tennessee. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Terry Schuster, and I'm with the Pew Charitable Trusts. Pew's sort of known for nonpartisan research and data analysis. When we provide technical assistance, it's, it's about um, trying to bring those skills to tough policy discussions. And we've been working in criminal justice reform uh, for the past dozen years. And so uh, I'll be able to speak about um, reforms that are happening in lots and lots of states. I personally um, worked in Utah and then Arkansas and then Alaska and then Louisiana and now Michigan. All right, Mike is on. No, it's not green. Can you hear me? It's on. It's hot. John Tilly from Kentucky. Uh, grew up about an hour from here in Kentucky. My dad went to Vanderbilt. Mom went to Lipscomb and Austin P and UT Knoxville. We've got the entire state system covered. <laughs> um, and my wife is here. Raise your hand, honey. And our children, the reason she's here, our children are just an hour away. So we uh, we took took this opportunity to come and, and, and enjoy Nashville as well after this uh, this panel. I am currently the Secretary of the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet in Kentucky, formerly a legislator for about a decade, also chaired the House Judiciary Committee, was a prosecutor before that, been in the criminal justice field for about 26 years. And my connection, to, we, we, we have a great connection here um, with a legislator, um, a family connection with this Tennessee as well. We, we don't need to bore you with, but it's a small <laughs> world. Also with our, our, our friends from Pew, I'm probably where I am today because of the data and the analysis that Pew began to do with the Public Safety Performance Project years ago. I began to look at it when I became chair of the committee in 2009. A couple of years later, with the help of the Pew Charitable Trusts and their consultants, we passed a, a piece of landmark legislation on justice reinvestment that changed the way Kentucky does business in criminal justice. So I'll talk a little bit about that today. So thank you. Wonderful. Um, I want to start off with... Um, as this debate on criminal justice reform has been waged in states across the country, um, how have you seen it evolve in your respective states? Um, how have you seen the conversation change and evolve? And I would, um, t Terry, be very interested to see how the differences from state to state, if there's any unique. Start here. Yes. Thank you, Julie. Um, I would say in Tennessee, it's been it's been a gradual change, just like it has been the, across the country. You know, we we were swept up in the in the tough on crime years, just like everybody else was uh, in the in the nineties and 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 beyond. But I think what has changed, what maybe kind of has driven that change, is that as we have increased those incarceration numbers now, it's unfortunately sort of like the opioid epidemic. It's like cancer. Everybody's got a family connection now or a friend or a relative, somebody who's interacted with the criminal justice system and has seen firsthand or secondhand how hard it is to then break back away from that. And I, I mean, I can remember as a kid growing up, my dad would just say, look, just be careful. You don't ever bump into the system because once you do, they don't ever let you go. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I think where whereas over the last several years, maybe more like a decade ago and beyond, you would have had lawmakers in my position from very conservative uh, and, and largely rural districts, although I'm kind of suburban now and, and also rural, um, you'd have lawmakers who might be uh, afraid of their constituents. They might think that their constituents think they're being soft on crime or that, you know, they were kind of into this hug-a-thug mentality, you know, that we hear uh, the buzzword. But but I think I think that has changed tremendously now. And so when I've gone to my district and really tried to lead on this issue, I get a lot of head nods in rooms where other folks might be afraid to kind of bring this stuff up. But instead, I'm shocked at how many people in the audience are nodding away. They'll come up afterwards and say, yes, I've got a nephew who had this issue. I've got a son or a daughter or I myself, you know, I 
you know, got a DUI when I was 25 and, you know, haven't been in trouble since, but it still haunts me to this day and so forth. So I think people are much more uh, into how do we how do we make sure that we punish people for their crimes when they're committed, but make sure that we don't hit them with such a huge hammer they can't ever recover. And I think it almost took us uh, going too far into one extreme to want to bounce back to the place that we are now. So. How has your, um, uh, the conversation with your colleagues in the legislature changed? Has it changed? Yes, for sure. I, in fact, I think you might have been in committee one day, Julie, when um, a colleague of mine, Bud Holsey, who's kind of Mr. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, during your presentation, you know, Mr. Lock em Up, Tough on Crime, former former law enforcement uh, and, and a member of the General Assembly, and he said, look, I've, I've developed on this issue. I, what I've realized is what we're doing is not working, and I, mean, I don't know that – I hate to talk about him so much he's not here, but I don't know that he was of that opinion last year. I, I think I think he is he is very quickly swept up, and so, so even folks in the legislature used to be very ardently against anything that smelled like we were softening penalties or anything like that has now said, we get it, it's not working. Um, and and I, I'll, I'll just cite one more thing before I let somebody else do some talking, but um, one of my political mentors early on, he's actually a judge, and, and he, he asked me one time, he said, do you know what the difference of being, of being scared and scary is? And I didn't really know how to answer the question, and he said, well, you know what scared is, you've been scared. I said, yes, that's right. He said, well, when you're scared and you're backed into a corner, you become scary. And that's what we're doing to folks. You know, uh, when we've got um, people who have just been hammered and hammered and hammered by a system that will not let them go. Another thing that this mentor of mine told me is he said, don't forget, the wheels of government grind slowly, but they grind completely. And if you get caught up in that system, they will keep coming after you and after you and after you. And so we're taking folks who are scared, and oftentimes we are making them scary. And I think... Tennesseans have seen that in a real way, in a real firsthand way, and said, mm -hmm. maybe there's a way we can give somebody a handout, uh, or a hand up, I should say, uh, when they're in that position. Yeah, you've run afoul of the law. Yep, you've, you've, you've made this mistake. But if you're willing to show you're willing to do the work, we're willing to be the people of forgiveness and redemption that we claim to be. And, and that, I think, is, is where the paradigm shift is, is that we've seen a lot of people swept up in that. Julie, before we go to the middle, can I just say, I think I've been doing this a long time, and that's the best way I've ever heard that articulated. Yeah. We were just, just <laughs> commenting. I, I, I've talked nice. about you know, f uh, individuals in the system uh, losing hope, but I think that's the better way because that's as a prosecutor, I could see it with people. I could see their transformation you know, from, from scared and, and uh, a little bit overwhelmed by the system with low-level charges and becoming entangled in it, just not being able to break out of that net. Uh, and that's a uh, chairman. I think that's an incredible way of articulating what what we do. Well, I, oh, I am too. I'm, I'll, attri I'll attribute it, but I'm going to steal it absolutely um, as best I can. But yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to make that note. That's incredible. Yeah. So I think in terms of how legislators have changed, or how how government officials broadly have started talking differently about criminal justice reform in the last um, 10, 12 years, I think the big trend. That, um, that we see across the country is this shift away from tough on crime as the message toward um, either sort of the, um, the right on crime, tough on criminal justice spending kind of frame or just toward um, how do we get the best public safety return on investment. I, I think that's, that, tends, that tends to be the biggest trend. I think we see um, you know, over the last 30, 40 years, uh, prison populations everywhere have just skyrocketed. Um, in the 80s and 90s, you know, policies that were adopted were all about increasing penalties across the board, expanding the number of things that are against the law, and then upping and upping and upping the penalties. And so the prison populations kind of um, expanded with them. And and uh, you know, every session for years and years, you would see multiple bills introduced that would um, uh, curtail parole time or parole eligibility or uh, or uh, reduce the amount of good time that could be earned or something like that. Um, and uh, and it's just been in, in the last 10 to 12 years where we've seen states start taking a different direction and start saying, we need to unknot this rope that we've been tying in knots. We need to sort of unwind this a little bit. And, um, and so you... Uh, 
and they've done it for different reasons. I think when people when people in uh, Utah were talking about um, reducing their prison growth, they were in this moment where the biggest state prison facility was on some land that was all of a sudden very valuable. Um, it was the um, it, it used to be sort of middle of nowhere, and then it became this sort of Utah's Silicon Valley, you know, they call it Silicon Slopes. And so there was this um, kind of conversation about, well, we have to move the state prison because this land is very valuable. And then that led into a conversation of, well, how big is the new prison that we should build? Um, the projection was, you know, really big growth in the prison population. And so they were like, okay, we should take this 7,000 bed prison and ins instead build a 10,000 or 15,000 uh, bed facility when we move it and and um, instead sort of took a beat and said, why don't we try and avoid that growth and build a smaller prison? And so th um, the, you know, they adopted a big package of reforms in order to sort of accomplish that goal in order to avoid that future growth. Um, there are other places when we worked in Alaska, a, a lot of the conversation was about um, Alaska natives and people who are living in pretty remote communities being taken away from their families and being um, at sort of, uh, there were these pretty deep wounds in Alaska Native communities around the sort of um, this moment in time when a lot of kids were removed from their homes and put into foster care and and put into boarding schools and built sort of th there was this deep mistrust between Native communities and the state government and and that mistrust was sort of just built on further with the uh, the number of Alaska Natives who were sort of taken out of their communities and put into the state prison system. Um, and so a lot of the conversation there was different. You know, it wasn't about the cost of the prison. It wasn't necessarily about, um, uh, you know, right on crime or anything like that. It was, it, a lot of it was about, um, about uh, ethnic disparities and about the, the impact on individuals and their families. Um, I think, you know, I, when we worked in Louisiana, I, I really relate to the thing that you said about Everybody knows somebody in prison. Louisiana had gotten to the point of being um, the most incarcerated state. They had the highest, uh, the highest rate of local incarceration, the highest rate of state incarceration, head and shoulders above even the number two state. Um, you, you know, you couldn't take a, a taxi or a lift somewhere in Louisiana and not, you know, strike up, strike up a conversation with the driver and not end up talking about somebody who is a, a close family member that they have in, in state prison or in the parish jails. Um, so I think that people, you know, uh, the way that people talk about criminal justice issues and criminal justice reform is different from place to place. Um, for sure, the biggest change um, has been kind of since 2008, um, there's been this big shift in um, away from ratcheting up penalties and toward um, uh, trying to undo some of that. So for the decade that ended in 2009 or 10 in Kentucky, our prison growth rate was 45%. What does that actually mean? It means nothing to, if you're at a civic club, they would stare at you until you then said, well, the state average was 13%. And they'd look at you again when you said to them, well, at a time when, that happened at a time when all state prison populations, most all, were exploding. And that also happened at a time when as the Pew Public Safety Performance Project would point out to you at that time, this country comprises 4.5% of the world's population, and you've heard this, I'm sure, this refrain, yet we house 25% of its prisoners. For one out of every three women in a prison or jail cell somewhere, that woman is in the United States. One out of every three is in the United States. And you could go on and on and on. So for our state, of 4.5 million people at that time had close to 23,000 people in prison, we took action because those numbers were so overwhelming and the momentum for it was so great. Maybe the way we looked at it differently in Kentucky, it's not that everyone knew somebody in prison or jail, which that, that probably was a high number as well. We weren't like Louisiana. We were leading the country in prison growth, not per capita incarceration, even though at today we still stand, in my mind, way too high on that list as well, or low, however you want to define it. That said, what maybe distinguished the Kentucky discussion was that we were overwhelmed first, like parts of Ohio and West Virginia and parts of Tennessee and Missouri, uh, Illinois, with the opioid epidemic. We began right after the passage of our landmark criminal justice reform measure 
to begin work on that piece of drug policy. We've, I think, taken some very innovative steps, and our overdose deaths are actually now going down while this, the countries go up in that regard. But we could see what was driving our prison growth. It wasn't violent crime. Kentucky remains one of the safest states in the country. It was then, and it is today. So it wasn't dangerous crime. The number one reason for admission then, and it is to still today, even though we've reduced that um, phenomenon, and the phenomenon I'm discussing would be revocations, technical revocations. In 2016, Kentucky had 16, well, let me back up, had 6,000, there's another number there, 6,000 revocations, 97% of which were not for new crime, just technical revocations, missed appointments, failed drug tests. So the conversation in Kentucky has been, maybe we should look at this epidemic as a public health problem, not such a criminal justice problem. To me, it has always been a square peg and a round hole debate. We're looking to a criminal justice system that really has its own set of flaws without injecting a public health nightmare, really a pandemic, squarely in the middle of it. So when I first started prosecuting, any prosecutor would tell you, any judge would tell you, 80% of our docket is drug-related. And you go into one today, and it's 95%. So that's, that's the dynamic. And I, I would end with this, the, the work of groups like Right on Crime, and I'm not doing this gratuitously, but the ability, listen, since Texas went first, it gives states and uh, the conservative states like, you know, listen, since Texas got out there and went first, uh, you know, despite the comic uh, renderings of Iran White, you know, they really did take some pretty smart on crime uh, measures um, before many other Southern and other conservative states did. Utah, for example, I was talking with their governor and their cop, tro- top CJ guy. They copied a lot of what was in our bill only because it was a good justice reinvestment strategy and a good template. It's not, we didn't own it in our state. We just happened to take one of the first steps. But they said Utah is an extraordinarily conservative state, and they were able to move on measures that were far. I thought far more, if you just want to say progressive, innovative, I, I don't, those, those don't have political overtones to me. And let me tell you real quickly about me. I'm, I'm a Democrat serving in a Republican administration, but I've never looked at my service, whether it's in criminal justice, drug policy, education, as partisan. I'm, I'm not a big believer in partisanship. In fact, I've always acted as a nonpartisan. And so this Republican governor and I, who we had never met, got together on what we could do to, to continue Kentucky's reformation. And so that's what I look, and when I look at this space, I look at right on crime and prison fellowship and chambers of commerce and councils of churches, and I look at coalitions coming together that never have in this space, which is totally unique to any other policy matter in politics. It just is. And we can talk about it and not reference whether we're blue, red, or purple. It just doesn't matter. And that's, that's the, the, the amazing opportunity we have that we shouldn't squander. That window may soon close. We've got to take advantage of it because we still have far too many people, low-level, nonviolent offenders, serving time in prison, which ultimately, as you know, is criminogenic. It just makes the matter worse, and we can do better. That actually kind of segues into my next question, which was, I mean, descri- explain to me or your describe how your experience in terms of the bipartisan nature of criminal justice reform and how the bipartisan nature of it at the state level really influenced the bipartisan nature at the federal level, which is probably how the First Step Act actually got passed in the first place. Yeah. Weigh in on that a little bit. I'll just jump in. I had the the, uh, the pleasure uh, of spending some time, uh, have had over the last year in particular at the White House, as they began to grapple with this, what became the First Step Act, building the principles of reentry. And I, I think I was probably the only Democrat on some of those calls at the White House. There's very small groups of 10 to 15 people building working with Representative Collins and others from Georgia on ultimately what became that bill. And then I got to be at the kickoff and then other meetings. And just this Monday, the celebration of that act occurred. There was a strategic planning meeting to talk about next steps. And as a testament to that, I never thought I would see Van Jones from the Obama administration on a stage with Senator Mike Lee from Utah with governors, my Republican governor from Kentucky, hugging each other, (laughs) laughing, talking – Talking about, I mean, you could see there was a relationship. This wasn't stage. This wasn't some politically expedient thing to do to, you know, let's let's put our arms around one another and then we're going to, you know, curse the other when we step off the stage. Not, I, you know, I was around them, and I've been around them before, but I was around them the whole day, and then I was around others in this space who you would consider from the far left, the middle, or the far right, and everything in between, whatever space you want to consider yourself. And that, again, is, is the phenomenon, and I think it's 
absolutely impacted by what the states and not not just I mean many many states have done to lay the groundwork for that despite whatever rhetoric you may hear the states actually you know went first and and who cares uh, the, the feds the, the, most of the prisoners in our country are in state prison and county jail as you know but it's equally important to 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 bring the feds along in Congress because that they sometimes set the stage and give states cover to then do more because this conversation to the general public now is about the importance of this issue and the importance of what we're doing. It's not necessarily the details. We can worry about the details in our committee meetings and, um, and in legislation. Incredibly important. But for the public to support what we're doing, I think by showing them the, the bipartisan nature of this and really the nonpartisan nature of it, because ultimately it's about, it's about human dignity and liberty and freedom and things we all hold dear regardless of what, what we consider ourselves politically. I, I mean, I'll just kind of touch on some of that, but, but, and maybe echo, but I think this came about at a very convenient time. I don't think it came about because of this. I think though, but it came about at a time very conveniently when we need something to rally around together. Uh, I come from a, from a blended family. My, my wife's from a very large prominent democratic family in Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> the first time I was introduced to her aunt, uh, she has a uh, a cousin who married a doctor who's who's from Spain, and he, he grew up in Spain uh, in the in the late seventies and early eighties. And and the first time I was introduced to to this aunt, she said, uh, "This is Michael Curcio. He's a Republican." And the aunt looked at me and she said, "Well, that's okay. Carlos's family marched with Franco." <laughs> 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 Sorry, just a little humor there for you. Yeah. Um, so so this is the kind of family I live in, right? So uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but but because of that uh, dynamic, maybe, but also just because I don't see everything through an R versus a D lens, I have always tried to attach myself to issues that that were really more bipartisan in nature, and especially being from a rural district that a used to vote for Democrats for a long time. I'm the first Republican since Reconstruction to serve my district, uh, and b these are working class folks who, again, know what it's like to interact with the criminal justice system and know what it's like to, to not be able to, to necessarily know where that next paycheck's coming from or that next meal, but they're, they're salt of the earth, you know, working class people. We're all looking for an issue that we can just come together on, for heaven's sakes. And we got plenty to fight about, and we can do that too. But, but if, if we can find some common ground on this, you know, and I hear some people say, oh, yeah, well, Republicans come at this because it's, it's, it's cost savings. It makes good fiscal sense. Democrats come at this because they want to let people out of prison. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's, it, it right. makes the most sense. It's, it, anybody who's ever raised a child or been in trouble themselves knows that, you know, there's got to be some redemption. There's got to be an ounce of forgiveness in here someplace. And, you know, don't excuse bad behavior. And by all means, if somebody's not willing to make a change, then we got a place for them. we got plenty of state prisons where they can stay. Uh, but for those who are willing to work with us, I think everybody understands that that is a message that we need to make sure that we get our arms around and to make sure that uh, that we go forth on that. Because if we can get this right, then we can get a lot of other stuff right. Um, next question. I, oh, did you have something you were going to add? Sure. Oh, sure. Go ahead. So uh, we've seen in – since like 2010, there have been 36 states that have adopted big justice reinvestment packages um, uh, th that have some combination of sentencing reform, probation and parole reforms, uh, some fines and fees reforms, and, and some, uh, some element of taking a portion of the savings and reinvesting it into non-incarceration type, um, type interventions and services and supports, both for people who are uh, in the system as defendants and offenders and people who are affected by the system as crime victims. And um, you know, you look at the vote count on all of those reform packages, and it is overwhelmingly bipartisan. A lot of them pass unanimously. Uh, almost, you know, all of them pass with strong bipartisan support. The um, lawmakers and, um, and and advocates have been doing polling in each of those states before and after the reforms, and see strong bipartisan support from the public, uh, including from law enforcement, including from crime victims. Um, that in general, like the um, the issue has. You know, the issue has been pulled on, it has been voted on, and it's getting um, just very strong numbers. 
Okay, so I like to ask, we've talked about what we've done in the past and how things have developed today in Tennessee, in Kentucky, and in the states that you're working in, uh, Terry. What's the biggest obstacles, the biggest challenges your system's facing today, and what reforms are being debated and discussed to address those? I, I, well, I don't, okay. I don't mind to start to say that, uh, let me, let me uh, just <laughs> as an intro, though, to, to Terry's comments, I, I would say that despite overwhelming polling that, that shows the public supports these kinds of reforms, there are still some, and I can say this because I was one, uh, I can talk, <laughs> there are some legislators who remain tone deaf and who don't want to take a chance and still think the Willie Horton ads of the world will come back to bite them. And I think that's unfortunate because it, you know, to me, the definition of legislative ethics is you make decisions based on what you should do, based on what's right, not what a poll, not what your own political instinct may tell you. That we need more people who serve for the right reasons. So I, I remain frustrated by some who stand in the way when they're out of a body. There's typically 90 percent, as we've said, of those on both sides of the aisle who want to support something. Yet some key voices will stand in opposition for whatever reason. So to the to the question. I think that, the, that that is the question. So the, in, in my state, we need to engage in more reform. It's true that we could have we probably would have 10,000 more people in prison, probably 12 to 15,000 more if projections were accurate when we passed our reform package in 2011. We still ought to have 5,000 fewer people at a minimum in prison today because so because there have been a couple of steps rolled, a couple of measures rolled back in that reform package. Um, to be specific, um, one legislator just dug his heels in and said, I don't believe – I think everybody who traffics drugs ought to have the same same penalty. Peddlers and Pablo Escobar ought to have the same penalty. That's the kind of lunacy that you deal with sometimes. And he got something that I passed when I was there uh, rolled back for that reason because of the heroin explosion, which he still doesn't understand began because 80 percent of all those who moved to heroin started with a legal prescription pill. It may not have been – their legal right to take it, but it was legally prescribed to someone. So we know how that that p pandemic started, right? So the biggest obstacles in our state remain the fact that we elect judges, and judges, the safe route for judges is to keep them locked up, whether it's pretrial or beyond, right? Um, we still elect commonwealths and county attorneys in our state. We still elect prosecutors. I'm not saying we're moving to not elect them, but when they're elected, they're still going to be concerned about that one case that puts them on the front page of the newspaper. And the media continues to sensationalize. As we shrink the media and go to other forms, it's still not any better. The traditional media, I say, we shrink it. Think about your television news. It's all crime and grime, isn't it? It's all sensational. They don't talk about it. I've done so many interviews I can't even count. My wife can tell you I couldn't get off the phone in the car. Just, just continue to deal with the media. They can take a... a a batting average that's about 975, but they'll focus on two or three cases, right? I mean, you, you, you can have success after success. We had a program we sponsored called Mandatory Reentry Supervision. We had 16,000 people that went through this program, which, which was a public safety center program. Instead of letting people out who served out without any supervision, without any reentry help whatsoever, we put conditions upon their release, not to, to tra entrap them, but to help them reenter. And if they did you know, foul up, we still had a link to them, right, rather than letting them go scot-free. Well, four K, you can imagine what happened, right? Well, four, four or five cases went belly up out of, at that time, 16,000. But this reporter reported on those four and not the 16,000 successes. But you just got to bow your back, and you got to stay on message. And you know what? They ran against me in 2000. I had one opponent in my time, and I'm not, I don't mean this to be boastful at all. I just want to give you an example. I had an opponent try to take a run at me because of my, my outspoken stance on drug policy on this reform back in 2014-ish, 12-ish, 12, right after they passed the bill. And I won 70-30 in a, in a very uh, conservative district. I was the, I, so it was a swing district, as they call it, right? So I, I believe that if you articulate your concerns to your constituents and you stand for what you know is, is actual fact, then you're going to be fine every time. So I don't buy the, the political argument. I just don't buy it. I think a, a lot of the like emerging issues, the things that are on policymakers' minds now, the things that are on practicing attorneys' minds now, are 
upstream from prison. So, um, you know, in the last, um, in the last, you know, five, six years, particularly states have done lots and lots of work on prison reform or sentencing <coughs> and parole reforms that affect prison populations. Um, in, you know, in just basically the last year, two years, there's been this enormous amount of litigation about money bail, um, and that's got policymakers' attention. There's been um, this en enormous um, kind of movement among sheriffs to talk about the number of people landing in county jails with mental health disorders. Um, there's been a county associations or county commissioners are bringing more and more attention to <coughs> jails, uh, to bringing that up to state lawmakers and saying, hey, you know, a lot of the laws and policies that affect who lands in county jail and how much it costs us, county commissioners, are made at the state level, and we're stuck with the bill, and hey, it's not turning out good outcomes. Uh, jails are your problem, too. I, I think if I had to predict, like, what's the next 10 years look like, I think there's going to be a shift of attention away from prison populations and toward jail populations. Um, right now, we're at this moment when hardly any state or at the state level has the data to, to track who's in jail for how long and why. Um, we just don't know. We have a, a sense of that jail populations have tripled in the last 30 years. We have a sense that jail costs have quadrupled, and we don't know why. We don't know who's in jail. We don't know why they're getting stuck there. Um, it might be about bail issues. It might be about misdemeanor sentencing. It might be about technical probation violations. We don't know. I think so. I, I think as as policymakers turn their focus to um, these issues, I think we'll learn a lot more. As the, the sort of data gathering gets more robust, I think we'll learn a lot more. Um, and I think a lot of other kind of similar reforms are, that are upstream are driven by local bar associations that we see. Um, you know, New York just passed discovery reform. Um, we see uh, in Missouri passed uh, a big package of reforms aimed at improving case processing. Um, we, we see, you know, South Carolina um, just did this big thing to recall tens of thousands of outstanding warrants on um, traffic violations and misdemeanors to, um, to cut down on the number of people who land in jail on old charges. Um, th th we, we start like w there. Are, I think these are emerging issues. I think we'll see a lot more of it in the next 10 years. Let me add one thing before the chairman goes. Just just it, uh, my understanding was Chief Justice Minton, who served on our task force, which which actually uh, recommended what went into that bill in 2011. I referenced and we have a unified court system and pretrial system in Kentucky, which allows us to know who's in our jails. So we had in 2016, 37,000 offenders who were assessed by our risk assessment tool as low to moderate risk. Not perfect tool. It's not a perfect tool, but it is a validated risk assessment tool that I think has more pros than cons. There's a debate there, I, I know. Assessed at that level, they served an average of 109 days in jail, and they cost our counties, which pick up the tab for that, about $125 million. So we knew that those people could all be released on their own recognizance or with condition and supervised appropriately in communities, and that's a staggering cost. And it's a staggering, uh, uh, you know, again, the damage done to those individuals is immeasurable. Lose jobs and families and connections and hope, and they become the exact kind of people that the chairman just referenced as being scary when they went in, just scared. Yeah, and I'll just say, echoes a lot of this, but some of the most frustrating things for me have not been the political hurdles because you can – I can meet with a colleague. I'm a pretty good salesman, and, and we can we can come up with, with a compromise. The most frustrating things, I think, have been the logistical hurdles. You know, at, at every turn, whether we're talking about pretrial or we're talking about any number of issues, it seems that the same answer keeps coming back. Well, you know, we don't have a unified court system in Tennessee. We don't have good data. And, and we're all now in this mindset. I'm certainly one of these folks that says, well, before we jump off this, this rock, let's, let's study the data. Let's make sure that we're making a good data-driven decision. And at every turn in this world, we're saying, well, we don't have any. And so then when you try to create public policy that gathers data, well, the entrenched, entrenched interests say, well, wait a minute, why are you studying me? Don't you want to study everybody? You know, kind of thing. And so, so the, the, the biggest frustration for me has not necessarily been the political hurdles, at least in this legislature. It's been the logistical hurdles uh, and, and dealing with, especially in a, a big state like Tennessee with 95 counties, 
uh, we occupy something like two thirds of the <laughs> southern <laughs> southeastern corner of the, of the of the country. But um, we've got a lot of very diverse counties. We've got some extremely rural counties. You've got Nashville, where there's a hundred people a day moving there, and so you get this massive disparity between yeah, a hundred people a day. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you get this massive disparity between I know. yeah yeah. Imagine, welcome to our struggle. Uh, no, most, no. <laughs> most of them are on Fourth Fourth Avenue. And yeah, they're trying to right. drive here. Today. That's right. Or they're or they're here for a bachelorette party, that's which right. is fine. We welcome you. Come on. Uh, yeah, we'll take your money. We we love it. Come come back. Come back often. Um, but so we've got this huge disparity between these these really wealthy, growing, booming communities who can probably afford on their own recognizance to to create some data and and put in in systems, and then you've got counties just west of me, like you know that that are are shrinking every single day uh and and you know they're losing their hospital they're losing the last factory they had and you know i i represent a county that unless you're in the city limits in the one incorporated community it's dirt roads i mean there's just there's not a paved road that that's that's outside of a, of a municipality of the one small you know 1200 person city that's there so so when you're when you you deal with these things and and a lot of us get frustrated cuz they all oh, well the the court clerks don't want to help us out, and they're 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 afraid to, to add any more work to their workload. And I, I've said that in this room before this panel started about about some issues that we've had. But at the same time, you got to look and say, well, you kind of understand. I mean, you know you know what they're dealing with, right? I mean, it's it, it, they're some of these communities don't have access to internet, and so we come up with this great idea of, oh, don't worry, just just um just scan and email this form to so and so in Nashville. Well, we don't have internet. You know, how's that going to work? So. So those logistical hurdles are are almost more frustrating than, than the political ones, um, because they're pretty hard and pretty expensive to solve. Yeah, can you talk about because you know we now have a governor who is really leading on the area of crim ran on criminal justice reform and is really addressing some of these rural issues to sort of bring everybody into the same position to reform mm -hmm. um, and come along together. How have you seen? the dynamic and the change have you seen any more is there more of a you have a more of a positive outlook in terms mm -hmm. of addressing some of these logistical issues for the people? i think so i think especially in tennessee right now you've got a governor with a lot of street cred right for for rural communities uh you know if we had elected somebody from nashville or knoxville or you know one of the one of the big cities one of the big four uh whether they were conservative or democrat you would have had this continued sort of rule versus urban divide. Uh, and so even even in the previous administration, I worked very well with Governor Haslam. I, I worked on his campaign. I was, I was a big fan of Governor Haslam's. But you had even very conservative Republican legislators that were in rural communities who just felt like, rightfully or wrongly, they just felt like they never really clicked. They never really connected. And, and, um, and, and that's not a criticism. I think it's just an observation. They just never felt that kind of real personal connection with, with, the, with that governor. And so now you've got a guy who barnstormed the state talking about criminal justice reform, who's also a cattle farmer, uh, who lives right outside my district in a very rural part of the state, who, who, can, who can speak um, very, very intelligently on these kind of face-to-face, -face, real humanizing issues and the power of compassion and the power of forgiveness. And so uh, not only are, are county officials and, and local political figures more willing to work with a governor like that, that they see as somebody who's one of them, who's really an ally, but also on the criminal justice front, it gives a lot of credence to that issue because people identify with, with Governor Lee and they say, well, you know, if a guy like that can be for it, I, I see myself as being a guy like Governor Lee. I may not be, uh, you know, as successful a business person and I may not have been elected governor, but he's a normal guy. He's just like me. And so if he can be for this, then I can be for this. Uh, so I think, uh, I think, I think that is, should not be overlooked in this debate at all is that we we've got a really uh amazing opportunity right now we also and sorry to keep talking about tennessee but it's what i know and we're here in tennessee um we have a huge number of brand new legislators um you know some uh i always get the numbers wrong but north of 25 new house members several new senators so a big big freshman class i think the largest freshman class we've had since we reconstituted the legislature in 1865 after the civil war so you've got all these new kids on the block who are trying to find their way. And wouldn't it be great if we never taught them kind of the old bad habits of 
status quo and lock them up and and you know make sure make sure you don't talk too much about about being uh, you know smart on crime because people might think you're being soft on crime. Instead, we can just be forward leaning and, and say, look, that's the way we used to do it. This is the way we're gonna do it. Um, and and let's you know let's move forward together. I have until two forty-five or till two thirty because I want to leave time for questions. Two forty-five. Okay. Um, I I want to ask Terry a question because you did a lot of work. We have a state director in Louisiana, so we did a lot. Right on crimes did a lot of work in Louisiana, working with Pew. Can you? I mean, Louisiana was the highest had the highest incarceration. Was it the highest incarceration rate, or had the most people in incarceration? The rate per capita. Uh, yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. and so they've done a lot of work to address not having that moniker anymore. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah so um, Louisiana uh, did a study just to try to understand better what's driving their highest in the nation um, imprisonment rate. And they, they found that um, the top 10 crimes that people were admitted to prison for were all nonviolent crimes, um, that the, the number of people who... Uh, had been in prison for at least 10 years, had doubled over uh, a relatively short period of time. Um, they had um, really just sort of enormous numbers of people cycling in for short periods and a small number of, and a small but growing number of people who were in for like 40 years plus. Um, they, they found that more than half of the people admitted to prison in the state were coming in on probation and parole violations. Um, and... Uh, and other stuff like that. So they they found a bunch of findings like that. They um, worked together to put forward a reform package that included um, sentencing reform for nonviolent crimes, um, reforms or reductions of habitual offender penalties, an expansion of probation eligibility. So that it used to be that you were only eligible for probation in a narrow set of cases, or if it was your first or second conviction, they expanded that to allow more people to be eligible for probation. Um, For good time for people in prison and for parole for people in prison, they expanded eligibility for both of those and also moved up the timelines on on both of those uh, for both uh, nonviolent and violent crimes and made the nonviolent ones retroactive. Um, And they they put a cap on how long probation uh, lengths could be um, and then they created an earned compliance credits system. I'm not sure if everybody knows what that is, but basically it's like uh, you you go a month um, following all of your rules on probation and you get a month's worth of credit off of the back end. So you can say that probation is capped at three years. You could actually finish probation in 18 months if you're doing everything right. Um, and they also took a look at fines and fees and they... they um, required uh, an ability to pay determination. They created this um, payment plan system where nobody could be charged. If somebody somebody had aggregate fines and fees that was bigger than they can pay in one payment, um, they put them on a plan um, and your monthly payment couldn't be more than one day's pay. Um, so one day's pay kind of makes sure that the, the sting of paying fines and fees is kind of equal no matter how much money you make, it's one day's pay. Um, and so they they created this system. They created a system for debt forgiveness so that if you paid consistently uh, over a period of 12 months, then you can have the rest of your debt forgiven. And they carved out restitution, said restitution won't be, won't be treated that way, but the other fines and costs will be. Um, and, uh, and passed it. They passed it with um, really strong bipartisan support. It got endorsed by the District Attorneys Association. Um, the grudgingly, though, right? they, they uh, we well, I just happen to know a little about that because the same group CJI came for round two in Kentucky, and yeah. I think it was a uh, quite the deal. I love my prosecutor brethren and sister, but uh, it's not a word, is it? But I'm going to use it anyway. But I remember they had to really carve out a good compromise though to get the prosecutors. But yep. they had an overwhelming majority of other uh, groups come together to support this in Louisiana. It was quite remarkable. Yep. I don't want to downplay it, but. Prosecutors are the last to come on board, as they always are. Well, they're hey, tough Guy Jones, I just want you to know, I, we see you back there, and we, and we love you. We love you dearly. We love hey, you. Hey, I know there got to be prosecutors in the room. I, listen, I, I, st- yeah. I, I go to every conference, and I was one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm still proud. I just, yeah, you got to bring some of the some of those along. It's the majority that's not the problem. It's a little minority. Yeah. So. 
I think, I mean, in Louisiana, I think the, the district attorneys association negotiated in good faith. I think, you know, they were there for the entire process. They asked tough questions. They, when they looked at the data trends, um, they were saying, well, this is what I see in this data trend. And they were being honest about their own experience and bringing their experience to bear on that. Um, they, they also had, um, at least for the most serious, um, cases, um, you know, but there were there were reforms proposed that did not pass that were about creating and expanding parole eligibility for people serving life in prison. Um, and th their opposition to that was about, look, we made a promise to the victim in this case. So you can't retroactively change that. You know, this person is going to go away for the rest of their life. Um, whether that's a fair promise that I should have made or not, I made it. And so they, they're coming to the legislature saying that and um, and th that was persuasive to the legislature. So they didn't pass that piece of it. Um, a year after reforms, uh, the prison population had come down 8%. The nonviolent portion of the prison population had come down 20%. Uh, Louisiana was no longer number one in imprisonment. They're number two. They're number two. That is a, a, a very big step. Um, they dropped that title of being the most incarcerated state. They um, had they, the, the number of people admitted to prison for drug crimes went way down. Um, the number of people on probation and parole, the caseloads shrunk because there were more people successfully exiting probation and parole and uh, way fewer people entering prison on technical violations. Um, they saved $12 million in year one. They took $8 million of it and they reinvested it with crime victims and in-community in programs for, um, for people charged with crimes or people convicted of crimes. Um, so... Uh, Everybody was really proud of it. I mean, there's a, a massive coalition that came together to support it. They got these amazing outcomes within one year. And then they were like, okay, what's next? <laughs> and so the next year they came back and they passed um, felon, felon reenfranchisement. And they, they passed a, a law requiring unanimous juries, um, w which uh, Louisiana is one of two states that, that where you could be convicted without a unanimous jury. And uh, and they're you know still sort of saying what's next what's next what's next they want to take on um, you know bail and pretrial reforms they want to take on more around fines and fees um, they certainly have to come up with some solutions about absent fines and fees how are they going to fund the court system so they have to sort of work through some more things um, but Louisiana uh, the folks there are who worked on this are so deeply proud of it mm -hmm. um, that and it's been such a strong legacy. Um, for all of the, the lawmakers who carried those bills. It was 10 bills, um, six Republicans, two Democrats, and one independent carried the bill, the bills. And uh, it, it has been this, um, it's been this tremendous legacy for all those folks. Yeah, Louisiana, it reminded me so much of the First Step Act that passed in Congress because just the magnitude of the coalition support. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, I'm a former prosecutor too. I think that they are one of the most important stakeholders to have at the table. And um, and for the First Step Act, the District Attorneys mm -hmm. Association endorsed it. IACP um, endorsed it. FOP supported it, endorsed it. And then you had the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and all these, all of these different perspectives and people who recognized they had some skin in the game came together. And you had, of course, the conservative groups and, and some left-to-center groups. And, and that really pushed that type of sweeping reform across the finish line. Louisiana was almost sort of like a, uh, I think we, we sort of took a, um, a part of your like game plan and, and implemented it at the federal level, getting that Louisiana justice reinvestment package through. Um, I don't want to take up any more time with uh, just questions for the panel. I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Anybody? First from an angry prosecutor. <laughs> no, I – before the question, let me clarify quickly. So what I find with, with groups like prosecutors or even, even judges, and I, I, listen, I, um, is you'll find, especially as I go around to the conferences and I talk to them offline, um, texting, emailing, private conversations, it's almost nine of ten would support major reforms. It's the vocal – it's that vocal opponent who oftentimes isn't armed with facts – is armed with rhetoric and sort of a, a firebrand and a torch and comes and scares the rest of them off, scares the other villagers off who want positive change. And I'm, I'm telling you, I've found that in, in my state. I don't know how you know prevalent that is, but I hear that it is the same elsewhere. 
And that's, you know, um, and I've served with, with folks, great folks who just believe the way they believe, and that's fine. And But it, it inhabits it Cong- in Congress as well. You'll find maybe there's a senator or two roaming around the halls in D.C. carrying a particular file or two with anecdotal scare tactics, you know, with things in a file. This is what happened when they did this, not to mention, the, again, the 98% success rate of something. And so you have that going on. It's just a reality we have to face. Well, and I want to say, too, for my, my friends in, in the – you know, DA, you know, my friends who are DAs and, and are prosecutors, that they they also don't get a lot of credit for all the discretion that they utilize. Right. I mean, how many cases don't they try? Great how point. many how many times do they say, "Okay, buddy, we're not gonna throw the book at you if you can, you know, behave for twelve months or so forth"? You know, because they're in their local communities, and so yeah, we can say how it's it's tough. Um, you know, when you've got an elected judge or an elected DA, because you know ultimately they're gonna they're gonna err on the side of being you know harder on crime because they're afraid that that bad press story is gonna come out. But I, th- I think the other side of that coin is they're in their community. They're going to the same fish fries and you know church bake sales that I'm going to trying to get elected. So they know the real life stories of those families who have had yes uh, several family members you know multiple generations who've had brush dust dust ups with the law. And so when they encounter one of those kids. Don't you think that that's going to make them that much more likely to want to try to help them and and keep them away from that life of crime that maybe a father or an uncle or somebody else came into? So so I, I do think there, there's two sides to that, definitely. Uh, and um, I know my own – I have three district attorneys. My, my legislative district straddles three judicial districts in Tennessee. And, and so I, I say, quote, my DA, but I've really got three. But the one that represents where I live, uh, you know, he and I are roughly the same age. We've got young children. And again, we're, we're on the campaign trail together, and so, so I don't want to I don't want to cast too too bad a light on that because I think that whole process does make them more bought into the community. They do understand, you know, who those families are who are who are most at risk, and and you know, no no less likely to be to be tough on crime when they when they see it and make sure that people are 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 paying for for what they do. But but let's also give them credit for all those cases that they don't that they don't try those things that they dismiss and those. That, that lot of grace and forgiveness that they do get to show on the front end that we don't hear about. And I concur with that, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm sure you all would also agree that. I mean, we talk, we'll, we'll tell a, a prosecutor, hey, you know, you should have put this person in diversion or you should have put this in. But it's, you know, there also has to be an evidence based diversion program in their community to yeah. divert them into. There has to be something for them to trust. Not just a program, but an evidence-based program that will address the criminogenic behavior. So there's so many components to it that that I think makes it important for stakeholders to come together and co- coalesce around the issue of criminal justice reform because it's really not as simple as, well, just exercise your discretion. I mean, there has to be accountability as a part of the criminal justice system that you can't remove because it would backfire on us as well. And so if you're going to divert people and you're going to put them into probation or do there has to be we have to also invest in these programs and make sure they're they're working they're well funded and they're evidence-based any questions Well, I'll, I'll just jump in. I'm sure they have thoughts as well. But I, I, I do think it has a lot to do with how pervasive, the, again, the opioid crisis as we've, as we've incarcerated more and more folks across the country. Again, it was like kind of my opening remarks alluded to, which is everybody knows somebody in their family or in their friend network who has had an interaction with the system or has had a substance abuse you know, issue that's then got them in trouble, gotten them in trouble with the law or gotten them fired from their job or, or made them, you know, wound up, you know, in, in a homeless type situation. You may not have somebody like that in your family, but I know plenty of people that I went to high school with and, you know, can, can tell you the names of folks who have overdosed and, and who are, or who are just have completely lost their lives. I mean, even though they're still living they're they're in a completely different universe at this point because of drugs and, and, and other abuse issues. So, 
uh, I think I think it has a lot to do with it that that um, unfortunately we had this perfect storm of this broad sweeping addiction problem that didn't just attack pockets of communities um, but but attacked every you know level um, and, and then also again this as we have this uptick in incarceration you've got folks just more and more stories out there of yeah my cousin my brother my uncle my sister had this issue with the law or 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 you know was incarcerated and and could never you know bounce back so I think that to me is really what drives most of the bipartisan nature of it and I would agree and I would add that it's a, and that's a great question there's a lot to unpack in, in that great question mm -hmm. the first I would say I think it's we don't have enough time to address issues of race and gender mm -hmm. in criminal justice they just absolutely exist cannot turn away from them we got to start talking more about them I come from a state where we incarcerate far too many women. Uh, our per female per capita incarceration is, is far too – I don't even want to say what it is because it, it's, it's, it's soul-crushing to me as a father of three daughters. And, and also as you – know, under justice is everything from the state police to public defenders to corrections to juvenile justice to drug policy, everything in between, medical examiners. So we've got it all. And so I see I'm straddling all these different worlds. And so when I go to visit prisons and I talk to nine out of ten women – who are there not for violent crime, but for mental illness and addiction and being victimized themselves and experiencing all kinds of traumatic events in their lives. And sometimes just being with a man who's part of a crime, mm -hmm. uh, uh, him or herself. So it's just unthinkable to me. To your point, though, I would submit to you that what we did to communities of color during the crack cocaine epidemic was unforgivable, no question. But the opioid epidemic is a little more complicated. We didn't mind when poor white people were dying in Appalachia in the eastern part of my state or West Virginia or Ohio or Virginia. Read the book Streamland and Dope Sick, either mm -hmm. one. If you've read them, anybody, yep. highly recommend two incredible reads. Sam Canones, Quinones, um, first book, Dreamland, chronicles that. Dope Sick by Beth Macy is an incredible book as well, a great follow-up piece. Not, not related, but just great perspective on where we are. I think clearly this is driven by – how many people we know are now dying and are now wrapped up in uh, this incredible epidemic? Um, I think that's that's very true. Um, and I think, though, I also think it's it's not just driven by money to your, the first part of your question. I think that's clearly part of it. When you got states that are strapped to pay pension obligations, uh, let me give you one example in my state. When I was, I'm, I'm 50 now. I can't can't believe it. I'm proud of it. But uh, I turned 50, and I'm able to look back on when I was a, a, a you know, two-year-old in 1970. We had 3,000 people in our state in prison, 3,000. Today we have 24,000. We spent $5 million on corrections. Today our budget in justice for corrections alone will hit $650 million. Now, somewhere in there we took a snapshot of that, and this isn't exactly accurate, but that's in our state our population has grown 38% in that roughly that same time period. You can imagine our prison population is more than 38%, 700%. Yeah. Now, the spending is even greater than that. Do you think we've spent the same on education, even though our education system in Kentucky is ranked? I mean, it's we have come leaps and bounds above where we were 20 years ago. But we have, our spending has not you know, become – it's been anywhere near that pace, nor has it been for pen, our pension obligation. We now have the worst funded pension obligation pension system in the country – since the Great Recession. We were 100% funded and went belly up, bad decisions, a lot of stuff at play there. And we still continue to spend this kind of money in, in corrections, and I still can't get the attention of some, some, a minority, in the legislative body. So what a great question. I, I think there's a lot, again, a, a lot to talk about there, but it, it's, it's a convergence of so many factors. It's the realization that we incarcerate far too many people for, for offenses that could be handled or for, for public health issues, for disease that can be handled in a public health setting and not a cell, not a prison cell. Yeah, and I'll just go back to what Texas did, because I think one thing that Texas did, and they don't have an opioid crisis per se. I mean, they have some opioid issues, but it's definitely not at an epidemic level. But what they did in 2007 showed that it, you can lower your incarceration rate and maintain and actually increase public safety. Absolutely. And that was something in the 90s and the 80s, and even up into that point, a lot of people did not embrace. They thought that, you know, incarceration is a, a deterrent. That's how you keep public safety, um, maintain public safety is incarcerate everybody. Texas kind of proved that against that, that, that was kind of a myth. 
So you can lower your incarceration population and still actually improve your public safety. And I think that that was somewhat um, a model that a lot of states took notice of. So you have Georgia, South Carolina, Kentucky following suit. So I think that has also been a part of that. But um, there are a lot of other factors. I'd add there, I think there's been, um, you know, politically, it used to be a lot tougher to be conservative, to be a conservative and to be um, uh, out there talking about criminal justice reform, that it, it's taken a good amount of um, signaling support from conservative thought leaders to provide some political cover. I think, you know, some of the most influential people, I mean, for sure, the, all the right on crime signatories are incredibly influential. You Absolutely. see Grover Norquist, you see Newt Gingrich, you see Rick Perry, who are out who there. Who vetoed the bill in 2005, and now he's a signatory. Yeah. <laughs> um, you see folks who are, um, you know, sort of investing in the types of, um, of uh, kind of uh, communications work and, and, um, and kind of political organizing, you know, the Koch brothers have invested quite a lot in criminal justice reform. Like th they're from the South. I think that in the South, we've sort of seen this uh, opportunity emerge partly because of political signaling, but also because of the recession. I mean, the, like in places that, um, that already have fairly small state budgets to then get hit by a recession and see that corrections is their second or third largest state expense I th that it, it you can't avoid the conversation say like, well, what, what can we do and you start looking to neighboring states so I, I think that's um there's lots of ways that conservatives have talked about here's why i care about this um you, you hear business folks talking about um the talent gap and employment um issues and re-entry into the workforce you hear um faith groups and faith leaders talking about um reconnecting families and redemption you hear i mean honestly you see like a, a lot of folks who uh had political lives who spent some time in prison for one reason or another and came out and said whoa um what i saw when i was in there i learned so much and we can't be doing this anymore that a lot you know a lot of the the big national leaders on criminal justice reform have spent some time in prison um so yeah a lot of I, reasons I would, yeah and i think i, I was the coke foundation is one i didn't mention we're working with uh, with them on an initiative and right on crime is involved as well as a great partner with something called safe streets and second chances and i know that it's um well we are one of the first four states with pennsylvania florida and texas very proud to be associated with it i think it's um uh, again i think it will bear some significant fruit um for those looking to do something similar we'll have some research findings soon about the success or failure and and sometimes it's it's important just as important to fail you know fail as they say fail fast figure out what doesn't work so you can get to what does. And so I think we'll have a lot of findings there. Um, and those are great points um, about, and I think as a guy, and I just had a great conversation with Grover just this Monday, as I referenced. And if you hadn't, I think for those on whatever your political stripe is, again, I think to question why you're in this space, my mother always taught me when somebody gives, don't question their motivation. Just don't. It's just not fair. And I've watched Grover Norquist get emotional talking about the need for reform in this country. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe he is sincere for those of you who don't like his tax policy. For those that do, just understand, I think when you talk to these folks, they're there for a reason. And, and it, it, to me, it doesn't matter. It's, it's almost like trying to um, exact judgment on someone who's, who's in the throes of addiction. You know, how did they get there? Well, they could have been someone who went for an oral surgery and got addicted to pills that way, could be predisposed to it. It doesn't really matter. I'm not there to sit in judgment of someone. I'm, I would rather be pragmatic. I'd rather have actually a heart for – for someone who needs, again, as the chairman said, that, you know, hand up, that, that you know, kick the ladder down a notch, let them come up and, and bring them up, you know, help them. And that's, uh, I think that's what makes makes this space um, so important for me uh, on a personal level. And I, I try to avoid talking about the financial piece of it just because it seems so obvious. And people yeah. say, oh, well, that's why Republicans are interested in this, because it, it makes good fiscal policy. So a lot of times I'll shy away from that. But I will say uh, you know, in, in this instance that it, 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 it does, it does remind me of my kind of economic principles and how, if you put the incentives in the right place and the right decisions will be made. And, and, uh, so I'll, I'll kind of harp on that just to Ted, I've got a friend who's an economist and, and he's fond of saying very dryly, well, 
things that are unsustainable cannot be continued, which is just true, right? <laughs> it's, it's an economic principle, but it, we also know that it's just true. Uh, and so in states where we have to balance our budgets and where we have finite resources, uh, and, you know, Tennessee is the lowest tax state in the nation. It's also the lowest debt state in the nation. We still have one of the only fully funded pensions in the country, and we pay cash for our roads. So when you look at those metrics on a page, and then you hear that we spend over a billion dollars in corrections, well, again, I'm reminded something that's unsustainable cannot continue. And so we, we're forced to deal with these issues, whereas I helped um, uh, through, I was honored to be able to get invited with Prison Fellowship to Washington, D.C. back in December when, when the um, First Step Act was, was still being um, lo- uh, debated in the Senate. And, uh, and I, was, I was asked to go and, and speak with, with some of our Senate delegation and some other members of the Senate. And I remember meeting with one of the Senate attorneys as well as, as, well as a senator, and I'm, I'm not criticizing at all, but one of the Senate attorneys looked at me and she said, give me the three reasons why you love this and why this makes the most sense. And don't mention economics because we have an unlimited amount of money to throw at this problem. And I thought you just confirmed every suspicion of every state legislator and everybody who's about to pay their taxes on April 15th, (laughs) that, that the federal government really is just in this blank check mode, you know? And so it was like, while I'm not here simply because this makes good fiscal sense, Maybe the reason why we led on this is because we have to solve the checkbook problem, and, and our friends at the federal level don't have that same incentive. So while I do shy away from talking about the financial piece of it because I feel like it's too obvious, it's sort of like, oh, of course you're for that because you're a Republican and it saves money, but because that's not it. It's just sort of like a, a very nice benefit of good public policy. Yeah. Come for the fiscal savings, stay for the compassion. That's right. <laughs> Let me get a plug, and I'm going to let them take it real quickly. I'm a, a honored to serve on the CSG Justice Center board, and one of the initiatives is called Stepping Up. You can It's like steppingup.together.org. I would take a look at that website and link it. It's a, it's a partnership with the National Association for the Mentally Ill, NAMI, NACO, the County Association, uh, American Psychiatric Foundation, and some others. But I think, and there's also data-driven justice and, and other uh, issues like that, which would lead you to those studies that I can't articulate to you at the moment. But that's a great question. Yeah, I was going to say, the short answer to your question is yes. And, and I could try to rattle off some statistics for you and probably get them wrong. And, and maybe th- there might be two folks up here on either side of me who would, who would have more of those specifically. But I, let me just talk anecdotally, because I happen to come from a district where I have a really high number of mental health and treatment um, centers, residential treatment facilities. I think it's just because... You can buy a big farm for relatively inexpensive and still be in middle Tennessee. And, and so it's an attractive place to start one of these kind of retreat centers and things. And so when I look anecdotally at the folks who can access treatment and recovery, those outcomes are, are tremendous. And, and so, so I've actually done a lot of legislation around trying to strengthen and underpin that community you know, to make sure that we've got good, clean, safe halfway houses in Tennessee, because once somebody's left residential treatment and recovery, we want them to sort of slowly transition back into society to make sure that we've got good data-driven decisions being made at that point. Uh, you don't have to listen to too many George Jones or Tammy Wynette songs to realize we got a substance abuse problem around here. And, you know, uh, in the South, we used to, you know, we drank a lot of moonshine, a lot of Jack Daniels, and unfortunately it switched to a needle at some point. And so we've got a lot of folks now, and especially as our communities start to hollow out in the more rural areas, used to it was work hard, play hard. Well, if you run out of work, you just keep playing. And so we've got folks who might be predisposed to have a substance abuse issue, but could keep it at bay if they had some hope and a family and three children and a dog. But when they lose all that stuff and their job, then they just turn to the pills because they're just hopeless. These people aren't partying. You know, you think about cocaine and marijuana, you think about like, you know, you, th- you think about like disco, right? People are having a great time. Nobody who's swept up in the opioid epidemic is having a good time. Nobody's having fun. They're all trying to get away from something. And so that's why 
this pretrial detention population, you know, it's easy for us to be hard on the bondsmen or it's easy for, for us to be hard on the judges. It's easy for us to be hard on the folks, you know, the magistrates who are, who, are, who are locking people up for 109 days on average and so forth. But at the same time, people are coming strung out and they've made some really, really bad decisions. And so we could forgive folks who are in law enforcement for just throwing up their hands and saying, I heard a guy last night on NPR. Yes, I'm a Republican that listened to NPR. Uh, <laughs> Mark so, this moment yeah, in time. That's right. no, I, uh, and uh, he, they, I, and I caught the tail end of the story before I pulled in the driveway, so I didn't hear the whole thing. I'm not sure what state he was in. But he was talking about how he came into law enforcement, and he said our community has been riddled with with the opioid crisis and with with drugs. And he said, finally the other day, I looked at this guy, and this guy said to me, he said, "Well, hey man, locking me up for 30 days isn't going to clean me out. I'm still going to be a junkie when you let me out." And he said, "I know, but the neighbors need some peace." And so we can forgive them when they get to the end of their rope and they say, you know what? I know locking you up is not going to help, but you got to quit robbing people. You've got to stop terrorizing this neighborhood with little old ladies in it. And so, so it's real easy for us to point the finger. But as we look at that mental health and substance abuse problem, I think that ultimately is really what we've got to look at. And that's where we're going to see outcomes and move the needle. It's expensive, though. It's very expensive. And so uh, what we hope is that as we make common sense reforms at the state level and we free up, I mean, we had a bill that came through committee this year because we eliminated some kind of old useless felonies on the books, quite frankly, you know, habitual motor vehicle, take my license, but don't make me a felon. Maybe I'm a bad driver, you know, so things like that, that, that kind of clog up the system um, that save a lot of money instead of just, you know, putting that back in the general fund, let's redirect it to, you know, treatment in lieu of incarceration, something like that. I'm, I'm yep. happy. I know it's enough. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we're out of time. I want to thank our panelists because they have not just been leaders on these issues, but um, they just have an incredible amount of 